So, um, I pray that these subjects will guide you in your search for truth. First quote I'm going to start off with is, history is the polemics of the victor. Uh, polemics, I had to look that word up, but it's basically controversial speech. And so, obviously history is written by those who've won. And we need to keep that subject in mind for, for this entire presentation is that this is the narrative that, that historians and, and those who have commanded historians to write books and write our history books and textbooks in high school and so forth to push that narrative forward. There are certain other narratives um, that lots of movies and documentaries that we're seeing these days are exposing and revealing. And it feels kind of depressing because all this is coming out now and we're like, why? Why is it now that we're all of a sudden get all the backlash? Well, because all of the rest of history in the past centuries, all the, 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 the bad narrative has been kind of suppressed. And so we've been hearing the good stuff, hearing the good stuff, hearing the good stuff, and now everyone has the power to publish their own documentaries, their own books, whatever on Amazon, and everyone is hearing kind of the, the backstory. No, actually it's this. No, actually um, child labor in China. Oh, actually it's this. Actually this is really what's going on. And so I think we are dealing with a very potentially depressing time period for many people because so much is being unearthed. Um, but yet, the polemics is, is controversial speech. Uh, this is why uh, Mr. Buckley Jr. says it, is that it's, it's, it's being able to use history in itself as an argument in your own favor. And so the history books themselves will speak more favorably towards those that wrote them. Uh, alas, the entire map of the world is written with Europe and North America on the up, on the top side of a sphere that has no up, right? There's a famous map that has South Africa at the top of a map. Just because you are the dominant power doesn't mean that the Earth is rotated favorably towards your direction, right? So, now, quick, quick game here before we uh, get started. By the way, who here thinks that America is a Christian nation and ruled under Christ. Okay. Hey, what's up, Alex? Welcome, welcome. Find a spot with the apple, either here up front or in the back there. Um, and by the way, for camera, there was no one that raised their hand on that. <laughs> Although Christ is sovereign over everything, uh, Christ isn't necessarily the head of our, our, our government. Um, who knows what AD stands for? Close. You got the second one. An anno, just A N N O. Anno, and then dominate or dominus. Uh, dominus is, is Latin for leader or lord or, or ruler. And anno, uh, uh, did anyone go on the Europe trip recently? Oh, okay. But anno is, is the word Latin for year. Uh, and so anno domine is the year of our lord. That's our. First one, so you can guess which religion is associated with that one. Christian. All right, CE. Who knows that one? Uh, common era. Common era. Boom, boom, boom. And the previous one is BCE, which they just stole from B, uh, BC before Christ. Um, that's which religion would that represent? Postmodern. Yeah, postmodern atheist secular uh, movement. What about AM? These are a little bit trickier. AM and AL. If you know this, that's like major, major historical brownie points, but. <laughs> no, I already talked about it. <laughs> Do you remember? Do you remember? Oh, I don't think I remember it now. Okay, but I know no the religion thing tied to, but okay. I don't remember the letters. This one, AM, is Anno Mundi, which is the year after creation, or year of the, of the Earth. Hmm. And Anno, or AL, is Anno Lucis. Is the year of the light. Lucis, the same way place we get looks, and, and Lucifer is, is the word for light. And that's in the Freemasonic tradition. So this is just our first start. You'll, you'll start to see these two in very obscure places, but the more you see it, the more you start, you're like, A M A L? Oh, I know what that means. Um, what's fascinating about these two is that these two don't point back to Christ, per se. Because for the Jews, he wasn't the Messiah. And for the Freemasons, they follow the Jewish tradition. Yeah. And so they both 
go back to 4,000, just like Christians do. We all go back in, in the Judeo-Christian calendar to a roughly 4,000 BC based on the genealogy in the Bible. Um, the Freemasons just simply said, you know what, zero, year zero, we'll just deduct 4,000 or add that to our modern number. So today's date would be 6,023. Mm. For the Jews, it's a little more specific. I forget what the number uh, is here. It's 3,761 is their calculated number that they go back to. And so you add that to 2023 and you get 5,784 AM on a Mundi. We have 2023 and 2023 AD. And then of course this one is the only outlier amongst those four if you put it in that context of the 13.8 billion. Now, in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. <laughs> ah, in 1493, Columbus stole all that he could see. <laughs> we just had Columbus Day a, a little bit ago. Uh, which nationality did y'all originally think Columbus was? Spanish. Yeah, Spanish. I didn't know, but you said Italian? <laughs> so he was born, I believe, in Genoa, Italy. And so he's actually Italian. That's why when Giovanni and our friends went to Chicago, they went to celebrate Columbus as Italians. And I was like, oh, that's, that's fascinating. But this is just a little bunny trail side thing, is that a little known fact is that historians use Columbus to divide the past into epochs, making the Americas before 1492 pre-Columbian. And after that, it's like post-Columbian or whatever. But, but that exploratory route, which is where this map over here of Amsterdam comes into play a little bit, that age of exploration and colonization was so major that they decided Columbus uh, to be that stable head figure for that, even for a time-based perspective. Um, that's pre-1492, it's pre-Columbian. Here are a couple of Wikipedia posts uh, of each of those um, time um, stamps. Anno Mundi, Anno Domini, Anno Lucis, um, and each of these agree to that 4,000 year roughly uh, historical narrative. Here you'll see that number, 5,961, 5,664. What, what number would this be in our Anno Domini system? 1918. Yeah, 1918 or 1916. Yeah, yeah. 16. no, you're good. Yeah, you're good. Uh, yeah, 1916. So they did. They they'll sometimes translate it, and they'll have that that same number, but then in the translation of their own version on um, cornerstones, on gravestones, on that those kinds of things. So here we have our timeline. And if we, if we go with the, the Judeo-Christian, even, even the Sonic tradition as, as being a 4,000 BC, uh, let's go back to some of the basics of our biblical history. Um, the writing of the Torah, which is the first five books of what we call the Old Testament. The Jews, by the way, don't call the Old Testament the Old Testament, because to them there's no New Testament. It's, it's the Torah, and then, and then the books that follow. So it's third century BC, before Christ, is what I'm gonna use uh, to follow here forward. Uh, the Pentateuch, and then, and then this goes on. This is a really, really fascinating book here on the table. It's the illustrated, sorry, the infographic Bible. If anyone ever sees this one, it is one of the most amazing publications I have ever seen, ever, with the amount of data that they have on, on the Bible and the accounts within it, and scripture, how much of scripture points to God under this name? How much of scripture points to Jesus with that title? And, it's, and it just goes on and on and on and on. Um, the Torah was written, and it was detailing Genesis and all the accounts um, that we describe as, as giving us our basis for our 4,000 year um, uh, history. In front of you, you each have an apple, and this is Feel free to take a bite from it, whatever you want. I'll take a bite from it as well. I, since we have already, we already in a Christian tradition believe that we are in the fall. Um, we are going to recognize the symbolism of this event throughout culture and what it did. So this is Genesis three, straight out of my Bible, right there, and. It talks about the serpent, it talks about the serpent uh, deceiving uh, Eve, the woman, and it says in verse uh, 4, sorry, let's go to verse 3, but God did say, you must not eat the fruit from the tree 
that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. That right there is, in large part, the basis for Gnosticism, which is different from agnosticism. And some of y'all, we've, we've talked about these things before, and so y'all know bits and pieces of this thing, but I'm, this is hopefully going to tie the whole narrative all together. Gnosticism comes from the Greek word gnosis, which means knowledge. A gnosis, the alpha prefix before the word gnosis, makes it the opposite. And so a gnosis is the lack of knowledge, which was what I was for a while as agnostic because I believed that I couldn't know anything. Not Gnosis. <laughs> now, I'm, now I'm a Christian. Born again, baby. Let's go. Um, um, because I believe that you can use knowledge to pursue truth and to understand life and its meaning and its purpose for us as, as humans here. Gnosis represents knowledge and the pursuit of knowledge as the base of all things. And so Freemasonry and other related Judeo-Christian cults actually come out, and even deism, sometimes you'll hear people describe the original founding fathers as being deists. Yeah, I'm joshy. Hey, Josh, come up to the front. How do you sit at a spot with an apple? Okay, okay. Um, so they'll describe the original founding fathers as being deists as well. But Gnosticism, if you dig deeper into it, is, is truly the root religion there. And so, with Adam and Eve um, uh, taking from this fruit, um, Masons look back to this event and say, this is where um, Lucifer, who is um, the fallen angel, right, um, originally was empowered and, and originally was trying to encourage humanity to gain wisdom and knowledge as that which the God or as that which our, our Abrahamic God has. And so Masons and those who believe in Gnosticism, uh, as much as I disagree with this stance, believe that it was a good thing for them to eat of the fruit hmm. and to pursue in that and to, to take, um, uh, to, to want to be like God. And this is where Luciferian tradition says it's actually not about worshiping Satan, it's actually about worshiping yourself. Whereas in Christianity, we worship Christ, and we deny ourselves. And so, it's the opposite, right? And so, Apple, for example, I believe their first uh, Macintosh, they sold for $666 um, when they first sold it as like this joke thing, but the symbolism is true. But that's, I think, part of the reason why they have the bite out of that apple, to represent that this is the root of all knowledge and that we decided as humanity to go down that path of, 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 of wanting knowledge and be like gods ourselves. Which, when you're in your Apple device or phone or whatever, that's what you literally have access to today. This is another uh, take on that. In Dutch, the word for Satan is Lucifer. Um, Lucifer. And that's the same word we use to call a, a matchbox. When we light a candle, hey, a uh, document Lucifer. Because its origins of the Latin is lux, right? Lucy is the year analusis. And fere is the infinitive word for to bring. Mm. And so the, the, the shortened version of that grammar of fere is fair, um, is bringer. Mm. And so Lucifer represents the one who brings light. Of course, we as Christians believe that it's an artificial light that is just merely flickering for us to be attracted to. And all that, that shines isn't always good. And so that's some of the root of where understanding the devil or, 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 or Lucifer as a um, shining object uh, for the Masons and all these traditions comes into play. Here is some of the, the genealogy as presented by viz.bible. Um, there's far, far more science about this to the point where we have an entire creation museum and Noah's Ark thing in Kentucky, I believe. Um, whether you believe in evolution or microevolution or, 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 or the 6,000 year idea is not uh, my um, 
but my concern pretty much, I'm not too concerned about that. For me, it's of larger importance who was at the start. Was it accident? Was it the Big Bang? Or was it something intentional? Was it God? Um, which I lean towards it being God. So they calculated it all out. That puts Abraham here. Uh, all this is in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Um, all those verses about this person begets this person, and father lived this many years and begat son, uh, in the patriarchal tradition that they did, it was very handy um, for, for passing down lineage and being able to write it down. Uh, can you imagine if they wrote down the father and the mother and the son and the daughter of this, like, it would be insane, and Leviticus, Leviticus would be like three or four times as big. Uh, not that that's a bad thing that we should do and have record of, though, of course. So they calculated this out based on those extremely long years that those individuals would have lived, uh, which we believe to be true, um, however you might uh, define that. Also, side note, creation was six days, right? And then on the seventh, God, worked, or God took, um, was resting. There's a verse that says that one day is as a thousand years. Some people believe that because one day is a thousand years, you have six days, that makes 6,000 years. What are we coming up to right now from 4,000? About 6,000 years. And then after that, God rested. I don't know what that means. For us, that implies the peace that we've been experiencing for the past 50, 60, 70 years. But take that as a, as a side, side nugget of that verse. Some people will, will take that very literally. So, Father Abraham, many sons. The reason, partially, that we still have the conflict today uh, between the Jews or the people of Israel and um, Palestine is because of Genesis 21 and Genesis, uh, I think it's a little bit forgot, Jack 26 or something like that. Uh, who here knows what happened with um, Hagar and then Isaac and Jacob? Y'all, y'all, yeah, yeah, yeah. But in Genesis 21 is the story of Abraham was very, very old, not as old as some of the other guys, but <laughs> he's very, very old, um, and his wife was Sarah, right? In Dutch culture, actually, when someone turns 50, we put up a big sign of an Abraham or a, a woman of Sarah at, at 50 to celebrate how this person is now officially old. Once you hit 50, you become an Abraham, and people will dress up on the streets as that. Um, that's how much Judeo-Christian culture is embedded in those Western European cultures. Um, in Genesis 21, it says, I will make the son of the slave, Hagar, into a nation also, because he is your offspring. And this is God saying that to Abraham. And it says, now the Lord was gracious to Sarah, as he had said. And the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age, at the very time God had promised him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to the son Sarah, uh, to the son Sarah bore. When his son Isaac was eight years old, right, this is skipping over, Ishmael, who had already been born to Hagar, um, was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him as God commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Right, so the important thing to take away from this is Ishmael <coughs> was the firstborn, but Abraham and Sarah decided to go the cheap route. They decided to get Sarah pregnant or have offspring for God's blessing, even though Sarah wasn't able to get pregnant at that time. So they had the slave, Hagar, get pregnant instead and say, you know what, we're going to still go bypass God's blessing and have a firstborn child, which was Ishmael. Huh, precursor to this, it's going to come back, this theme of the firstborn not being born the quote-unquote biological right way, but the second born stealing the blessing. Mm. Stealing might not be the right word here, but Jews uh, would argue that it was meant for that person. So then, here we have genealogy, again, from Ada, uh, Adam, <laughs> Adam, <laughs> Adam and Eve, all the way down. And here we have Abraham, or as in, this was done by actually a Muslim website. So in, in the Muslim tradition, it's called Ibrahim in Arabic. Ibrahim, um, Ishmael, and then Ishak, or Isaac, was the second born, and then Madian, and, and there's other studies there. 
But Ismail is a precursor, if you follow it all the way down, to Muhammad. Hmm. Right? This is some of where they take their pride, is, is that the lineage for the original blessing of the firstborn of Abraham was coming ultimately to Muhammad. Welcome, welcome. Come take a seat. Come take a seat. Um, for the Jewish tradition, um, we follow it back to Isaac, right? And that's what those verses talk about, is that you will have a nation also because he is your offspring. So this is God saying, regardless of the firstborn, you will also have a nation. Both of y'all will have a nation. Then, the second part, Genesis 25, verse 23. Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. Ooh, wow. The older will serve the younger. The older, in this case, being the firstborn, the Palestinian connection, and the younger being Israel. Um, this is the story with Jacob, um, who gets the birthright instead of Esau, right? And so the mother and the father in this case is Isaac, because we're following the Jewish lineage down. We go here, Isaac, Yakub for the Muslims, Jacob. Notice this is I think Esau, but they don't even. Yeah, there's there's a lineage here, but it kind of Job. Job apparently is a descendant of, of, of uh, Esau. <laughs> Which, there you go. Uh, Jacob, <laughs> Joseph, Moses, Aaron, all these, all these Christian figures that we, within our Christian Jewish narrative of these stories we think of, we, we don't as often talk about Job and obviously Muhammad and, and other, other prophets <coughs> in this. But the ones that we talk about within our narratives, within our churches, are the ones that are the Jewish ancestors to this to this story who we believe received the blessing. So two nations and um, the mother um, the mother um, helps uh, helps Jacob put on the fake uh, skin of the animal to go to his father Isaac and say, hey, I am your firstborn son, faking him, tricking him into believing that he is the first one who deserves the birthright. And now we have the same situation as the previous father who tricked the uh, birthright in getting going towards the second born instead of the first. Not the most healthy way to start an entire religion for the entire planet. Um, so now we're at about 2000 BC, um, and uh, that puts that in context there. And so in 300, BC, which is 1700 years later, they write about those events, uh, which I'm assuming were, were told orally um, over those years before they were written down at some point and then passed down people by people. Jesus' birth, not too disputed among scholars these days. Some people will still be like, no, 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 Jesus was never born, he, was never, he never existed. Yeah, there's more evidence for Jesus' existence than there is for Shakespeare, and generally everyone believes that Shakespeare existed, so I'm not going to dispute that with anyone. <laughs> um, Rome, the Roman Empire, as we know, the Jews during the time of Jesus were ruled by the Romans. Their empire, like Jesus was alive in, in, in on our planet during one of the largest empires ever. There's always gonna be a largest though, like, okay, is it Britain, is it China, is it the US? We could, we could talk about that forever. Why, why Rome, why the Roman Empire? But that's not as significant per se. You could talk about it being part of the spread the Roman Empire, believe it or not, with all its, uh, a lot of Romans' visual imagery and gods even comes from the Greeks, but it ended up becoming Christian. Um, Nero famously blames the fires that were faked and started in, in Rome on the Christians as a specific attack. We see the same kind of tactics happen all the time. You can decide which ones in our modern day are the, those events that get intentionally started just to blame on someone. Under Vice Emperor Constantine, Rome starts adopting Christianity, the high row symbol um, and the in hoc signo uh, symbol, which kind of relates to this image, um, were part of this. Um, 
his, he was the son of his, of his father, obviously. <laughs> and his father was very much against Christians and per persecuted them. But this guy, his son, he was a little more with the times, shall we say, and understood some of the Christian lingo a little bit better than the precursors and said, you know, this is actually a really, really good thing. And so he's the one, when they went to the battle here in Rome, you can still go to that bridge today where this famous, famous battle happened that basically brought Christianity to the entire Roman Empire. They claim to have seen the symbol in the skies um, that was a Christian symbol uh, in hoc signo vicenes or vinces, which is Latin for in this sign you will conquer, or in this sign you, you will conquer, um, which is why in certain places if you say I H S, um, let's see, let's see one of these. Oh. Yeah, IHS in hoc signo, and then sometimes there's a V. Um, that represents the the Constantinian uh, sign that he believes God sent. And then they had uh, them put the Cairo, which is two Greek letters. So this is the Latin and this is the Greek. I know Brian already knows this. <laughs> um, the Cairo is the first two letters in Greek of Christ's name, mm -hmm. Christos, which is not even really uh, his name just means Messiah. Um, we know Christ's name more as the Jewish, which would be Yeshua, which is what the English equivalent would be Joshua, even though Jesus is just a, a Greekified version of Christ's name. And it would be spelled, um, I believe, something uh, like, like this. Both of these are sigmas, both of these are s's, but the sigma at the end of the word is uh, written like this, and any time a sigma is at the beginning or middle of a word, it is written uh, like that in Greek. Um, just so it's it's kind of confusing. But why two s's? That's, that's just what they decided. Um, and ye, this is an i, or the iota, or the eta, and then the epsilon. So it's Jesus, uh, which is the Greek version that they derived uh, to Jesus. Uh, sorry, from from Yeshua. Jesus, and then we made it Jesus. So our version is really kind of <laughs> derived a couple couple evolutions down. Um, this is interesting. These are by 200 AD, all the green, um, which I'm sure a lot of those missionary journeys that we read about um, with Paul and others are related to these churches in Colossae, Ephesus, Philippi, you know, Thessalonica, Corinth, the Church of Corinth. Um, those are the areas that were starting to, to have this Christian kind of revival take place. And then finally, as that is already happening, as these revivals are already taking place, then Theodosius uh, proclaims Rome as being officially, officially Christian and uh, the Battle of the Bridge um, related to that. So there's a timeline. Now, shortly after this, so again, we have the rise of the Roman Empire, which now becomes Christian all across Europe and even in, uh, around the Mediterranean. The response to that, and then later, is once these texts become uh, famous and everyone understands them, 300 years later, now there are scholars in the, uh, in the, in the Middle East, again, this, this whole thing spreads, that, that come to learn about the scripture and Prophet Muhammad uh, understands some of the genealogy, some of the some of the history. Uh, again, he's a descendant, so that knowledge probably gets transferred down. Hey, hey, hey! We are the descendant of this and this guy, Ishmael. Um, between 609 and 632, um, dictates the Quran. Um, I don't want to cause any offense towards Islam, but this is some of the verses that might call people to see some of the inherent. Uh, enmity and enmity against um, the Jews uh, as it was written in the Quran during the 600s. So in, in the Quran, it's a surah instead of a chapter. And so surah 5 verse 64 um, from a scholar named Yusuf Ali. Amongst them, we, Allah, have placed enmity and hatred until the day of judgment. Every time they kindle the fire of war, Allah extinguishes it. But they ever, they being the Jews, Oh. But they ever strive to do mischief on earth, and Allah loveth not those who do mischief. All right, this is just one of a couple of these types of verses 
Um, but you can already see some of these, these former geneal uh, uh, historical <coughs> family struggles, shall we say, or battles between former tribes starting to boil up in some of these, in some of these writings. Right, so then 600 AD, we have the birth of Islam. And then shortly after that, as Islam and their empire grows, we have a response from the Christian side in Europe. <laughs> and the Roman Catholic Church, which by the way now is in Rome, and we have the whole Vatican. I don't know when the Vatican was founded exactly. That would be interesting. Um, the directs the religious wars of the Holy Land uh, uh, underneath the Christian Latin Church, and they, they, across all of Europe, they gather people together to go to the Holy Land and, and reclaim what they believe to be theirs, what they believe to be Christian. This is an interesting slide. This is, there are articles about the Crusades from a Muslim perspective that are, that are vastly different, and apparently this is one of those battles that was won by the Muslim side, and here you see uh, one of the knights uh, giving up his sword or something like that. <laughs> Um, but most of the imagery we have seen, again, our history is written by the victors, um, is, is this praiseworthy thing from the Christian Christian side. So that happens for almost literally 200 years <laughs> of, of fighting and trying to reclaim what the European Christians thought to be theirs. This is a different talent, but some of the other pieces, the start of Crusades, the Knights Templar, which the Masons will, will put a lot of homage towards. Uh, the Order of Malta was started. Again, all these Christian cross-based um, pieces and orders and groups start being uh, founded. The Jesuit Order, here's the in hoc signo sign, right, pointing back to history. And then right before the birth of America, apparently the Jesuit Order dissolved, even though it's still very much alive today. Even the school Loyola, has Jesuit connections named after Loyola. Um, these are some of those military orders that have been founded. Uh, Order of Malta, if you go to the nation of Malta, my father has been to the nation of Malta, and he brought back, it's one of those little souvenirs, this logo, a cross based, um, uh, cro a Maltese cross, I believe is what it's called, uh, or eight pointed cross, or star, eight pointed star, whatever it is. Um, is like their, their sign on their flag and everything. Um, and so these, these symbols, these elements of this pseudo-Christian heritage that I believe got more obsessed with the treasure and the, uh, the power and the, the historical artifacts from Christ's day and the scriptures and the finding of all that than with Christ's writings and how we should live our lives as human beings. That was what they they obsessed over, and they um, and they learned to turn that into their own brand and, and groups and people to to gather across this. This is one of these groups that might have uh, sparked controversy in recent years, but I think a lot of people only know about it in meme terminology. Uh, it was started in Ingolstadt in Germany. This is a uh, painting or drawing of. Again, you see the in hoc signo up in the corner. Um, and um, this is just an idea of, of the area around which it would have been started. Um, by the time he died in Bavaria, he would, it would have been um, the early um, decades of the German uh, Reich, or German um, nation starting to form, although that took many, many, many more years. But Adam Weishaupt is a credit to, to being that. It's, it's a... Um, order, just like many of these other orders, that got together uh, in a slightly secretive manner to discuss things that brought them together that involved um, Judeo-Christian roots and secrets and treasure and, and, and brotherly love and charity, all this kind of stuff. So that brings us to one of the biggest kept secrets of the United States, Freemasonry. 